Hey, everybody. Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake. I'm Reza Aslan. And I am Rain Wilson. I'm sorry, what's happening? I am Rain Wilson. Oh, look. It's the Enodium P23 <laughs> Explosive Space Modulator. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, what is going, did you sit on your balls? What is happening here? I Where, what are you, am what are you a Martian. Oh, you're doing the Bugs Bunny guy. Marvin you're doing the, the Martian. I have been cast in the live action version of Marvin the Martian movie. Is that, a, oh my, is that true? Is that happening? This is happening. Well, I'm auditioning, but I, that, that's what I see happening. <laughs> I mean, but, with that that act, you did it. You did it. It's yours. The the it's the an gig explosive is yours. space modulator. Wait, I imagine that to get the job, you have to first become a, an expert on all things Mars, right? I mean, maybe that would help. That <laughs> that might be important. Maybe some research. Did you know that the ancient Sumerians actually were obsessed with Mars? They they uh, they called it the wandering star. Wow. They thought that it it, it uh, portended all kinds of like malevolent, you know, prophecies about what's happening on well, Earth. And the, and the Romans named Mars after the god of war or was the god of war named after the planet Mars? How did that work? I'm pretty sure it was the, the planet was named after the god of war. I don't know what the Romans called the planet, but I know that like the Romans were upset. The Greeks had like all kinds of uh, associations with like the god of war and and all that stuff, so that you know the Romans borrowed it from but, them. But, but also in the in the New World, uh, in the in the mythology of uh, the Aztecs as well. Absolutely, and the Maya. Look, I mean, th- here's the bottom line: is that we as a species have been obsessed with Mars for a very long time. I mean, all all my my favorite, uh, you know. Uh, 20th century uh, sci-fi books, movies, they all involve Mars. Uh, It has loomed large in the human imagination since the get-go, since we were building fires late at night in caves and there was no unobstructed, there was no light pollution in the sky and we saw that, that little red dot following the sun crossing the sky. Um, Mars is lit. Yo, I remember reading the Martian Chronicles when I was a kid sure. and thinking mm-hmm. to myself, like, this mm-hmm. is a, this is a thing. Like we could actually, we could actually go to Mars. Like that's a, that's real. That's a real thing. You know, like that could actually happen. And here we are, we're sending probes up there. We're sending, you know, these like helicopters that fly around Mars and everyone's just like, well, let's do this. Like, let's go to Mars. But let's just go to Mars also brings up a lot of questions, Reza. I mean, should we go to Mars even if we learn that it already supports its own living organisms? Since our time left on Earth might be finite, do we even have the moral right to explore other planets? Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Cast Media and Soul Pancake. These questions are just too big, Brain. Like, there's no way. How are we ever going to find a get? We'd have to find someone whose entire job would be to be, I don't know, something like a, I don't know, like a planetary protection specialist. But that's not a real job. That's like a job that you have that on you TV. just made that up. A planetary protection specialist? <laughs> exactly. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I'm hearing something. Wait, we, we've got one? What? No. Yeah, the producers are telling me that we have a planetary protection specialist who works for NASA. No, it's not Dr. Mugega Cooper, is it? It, In fact, it is. Amazing. (laughs) She is an American astronomer and the lead of planetary protection for the Mars 2020 mission. That's right. She has uh, graduate and doctoral degrees uh, in mechanical engineering. She graduated high school at the age of 16 and then got her PhD at 24. Like, blah da big deal. Impressive. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not impressed. Yeah, well, I got my GED at 27, so. Uh, her dissertation focused on non-equilibrium plasma sterilization of spacecraft materials, which is weird because that's almost what I wrote my dissertation on. But Really? You know, yeah, last minute yeah. I was like, no. She's been working as a planetary protection engineer at JPL since 2010 and appeared in 33 episodes of How the Universe works. Let's welcome Dr. Moon. Uh, welcome to the show. Mm, the impressive space modulator, Dr. Moo. 
Dr. Moo, thank you so much for joining us. Does anyone ever ask you uh, about like your opinions on cow science? On cow science? No. Uh, although now I feel like I've been cheated. Uh, many great conversations. <laughs> I don't think people with unusual names should be uh, insulted on this show. Okay? Rain and Reza and Dr. Moo. That's true. That's true. We are unique individual souls. Also, I would imagine most people you talk to are more sophisticated than we are. So, No, I, I, I hear the whole gamut. You know, I, my, my name has been smushed with all types of words. <laughs> so <laughs> I've heard it. So you are a, and this is a true thing. This is, I didn't make this up. This is actually a real job. You are a planetary protection engineer, which sounds like, something uh, a red shirt in Star Trek would do? No, thankfully, we're not one of the red shirts. We we survive from mission to mission. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, the the analogy I've been using these days uh, are we're the modern day, the real life guardians of the galaxy. That's actually way cooler than... Uh, they wouldn't technically be red shirts. They would be blue shirts because they'd work in the science division under Spock. Oh, nerd. Oh, come and correct. <laughs> Speaking of nerds, you are you are quite quite a, a prominent nerd yourself, Dr. Moo. So for the non-nerds uh in the, in the audience, and very few of them, uh, could you explain to us what exactly is a planetary protection engineer? Yeah, a planetary protection engineer is a person who is in charge of making sure that the spacecraft that we're sending out. It could be a spacecraft going to to Mars, to Europa, to um, the moons of Jupiter, uh, other moons of Jupiter, um, to make sure that when we send the spacecraft out, that it is clean enough so that it doesn't inadvertently spread our Earth-born microbes out to that environment that we're trying to explore. So that you don't, like, uh, infect the whatever, you know, like the life forms, the biosphere. Exactly. It's, it's, like, it's like a primitive prime directive. It is Star Trek. Exactly, yeah. That's what, But we're not the red shirts, though. <laughs> right, but it is the prime directive in, in to not interfere with the potential life or even lack of life on another planet because you don't want some dumb astronaut who dropped a sandwich on the floor and then it flies over to Europa and lands yeah. and the, there's a green mold and then it gets onto the dirt of Europa. And then everyone thinks, oh my God, we've got foreign life that looks just like this common kitchen mold from uh, from Florida. I think I've actually seen that episode. But yeah, you've seen actually eco these ecological impacts, right? In different sides of the good side and the bad side. There's a good ecological impact. You know, I know some of you out there, I'm sure I have, right? I've had kombucha, I've eaten Activia, um, and that has a that's a positive ecological impact of a microbe going in an environment that's new, and it does good things, right? Probiotics. But then you've seen the negative side when you ate maybe a sandwich that stayed out on the table too long, uh, and you got food poisoning. So that's a negative ecological impact. So since you, if we don't know, we can't predict if we're going to have a positive or negative impact. So the goal is don't spread our contaminants at all. Okay, I'm sorry, but that seems like a cool job. Does that not seem like a cool job to you, Rain? It sounds boring and and it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like you use a lot of like Lysol basically. And that's all she does. She basically sprays the ships with Lysol. I'm more interested in your story. Um you you got your PhD at age 24. You graduated from high school at 16. Show off. And <laughs> what brought you I know you're not in any way shape or form any kind of spokesperson for NASA. Um but what brought you to NASA and working on Mars expeditions? Let us know a little bit about yourself and your personal story and history. Yeah, uh, the reason why you you read all of those young ages, you know, when I started uh, high school and college and and graduated with my PhD, it's because I'm a very impatient person. Um, and uh, when I was a kid, I saw Carl Sagan's The Cosmos, and that turned my light bulb on. I was poor in math and in science and in reading. Uh, still don't read as much as I should, uh, but I I was. That those were my least favorite subjects. And it was that moment that allowed me to put it all together and say, oh, this is why my math class and my science classes are important. And from then on, I just spent every single summer while all the other kids uh, had summer vacations. I was taking summer classes to double up on my, my math courses and just graduate as soon as possible so that I can eventually go to NASA and, and make some major changes and understand how our universe works. Are we alone in this big 
vast universe. This is amazing. You, you, you knew exactly what you wanted to do and then you like pursued it and like you're literally there right now doing that. So that's very inspiring. So planetary protections, uh, Dr. Mu, are strictly enforced right now. But one of the things Reza and I were talking about before this interview is what about when the space exploration opens up to commercial companies, which is going to happen? Um, how can we ensure the same measures are in place to avoid contaminating other planets with our sandwich germs? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Is there some kind of international imperative uh, law that needs to be passed? Yeah, there actually is already an international treaty, the the Space Act Treaty, 1967 uh, Space Act Treaty. Um, and in that treaty, the, it essentially lays the foundation of planetary protection. So as the United, United States is one of the signatories of that treaty, so we have to abide by it. And commercial entities technically have to abide by those policies to make sure that when they explore, they do it also in a responsible manner. The thing is, you know, NASA itself isn't a regulatory agency. We need we need a the carrot and we need a stick. Mm. <laughs> NASA's not a stick. Um, so we have to, there's kind of a gap there where you need to really incentivize the, the companies to really follow through with that. And there has been a push lately to, to make planetary protection more accessible, uh, cheaper, more robust, uh, so that they can easily implement that for their flight projects and not worry about the bottom line. Wait, okay, so... We uh, how do you incentivize this? How do you in incentivize, you know, SpaceX or whatever to follow the rules? Yeah. Uh, one way is, you know, making sure that when they get the award to say, this is what we're going to be looking for, uh, right? <laughs> otherwise, no space for you. Uh, yeah, no space for you. You go back in the corner and think about what you've done. Um, yeah. And, and beyond that, those are the main ways. <laughs> it's a list of one. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it, it's just the right thing to do. And you have to have that self-motivation. You have to have those values as a company to, to know that as you explore that you you're putting a lot of things in jeopardy if you don't do it in the proper way. Do you want that on your on your back, on your shoulders? Sure, sure. And of course, as we all know, people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, all about values, all about integrity, nothing to worry about. Obviously. Doing what's right. Yeah. It's all mm -hmm. about yeah, doing what's yeah. right, you guys. Let's shift the discussion here. Thank you so much. But let's shift it to what we all really want to talk about, which is Mars. Mars. You were involved in the Mars 2020 mission. Um, tell us about what you did and what makes this mission so different than the ones before it. Yeah. So I was the planetary protection lead for the Mars 2020 mission. And that meant that it was my job to really ensure that I was the person that stood on the chopping block and said, yes, this spacecraft is clean enough to, to push the launch button. Um, and, and then, of course, people above me signed the right papers to push the button. Um, but we learned so much in the past. You might be wondering, why are we sending another rover to Mars? I know you two aren't because you love Mars so much. We love Mars. Um, but this, this Perseverance rover has stood on the robotic shoulders of its predecessors. We knew from the last rover missions that there is great geology there, interesting geology. There is a habitable environment and there is signs of water. Uh, and so the next thing to do is look for signs of life, at least ancient life. And that's what this, this rover is going to do. This is really what we wanted to, to talk to you about was obviously Mars and I mean, and this is this is I think most people around the world, not just here in the United States, share the the obsession that Rain and I have uh, about the red planet. And I, and I'm curious, like, what do you think that's all about? I mean, there are entire religions, right, that are based on obsession with Mars. I mean, you go back to ancient history, the ancient Sumerians, right, the first great civilization. Uh, in, in in human history, um, had so many of their rituals and their and their mythologies focused on um, uh, Mars and and the 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 rising and falling of Mars. This is true. The Mayans, of course, the Greeks loved Mars. Um, I mean, Mars has been a, 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 an, an obsession for like science fiction, obviously. Yeah, which is kind of the new religion of the modern world. It's true. Uh, Science fiction, uh, Mars attacks, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, yeah. the invading Martians, 
Uh, as soon as we could, we had telescopes. That was one of the first things, obviously, after the moon that we zoomed in on. We could see that it was another planet. Um, it goes on and on. The Martian Chronicles. Yeah, right. We were, we, were t- we were just talking about this earlier, like all our favorite Mars movies and books and everything. But so the, the obsession is obvious. Including that documentary called The Martian with Matt Damon. <laughs> he's still there. Is he? I hope he's okay. Folks, when it comes to losing weight, uh, there is a lot of pressure out there to label foods, either good foods or bad foods. But you know what? That's just creating unnecessary dilemmas. Well, guess what? Noom is here to change how we see food. And they do it with a psychology-based approach that looks at what you eat, but also how you eat. So instead of trying to cram your life into someone else's idea of health, try Noom. Noom uses a psychology-based approach to find a healthier balance that's, you know, moldable to your life. My good buddy, Ben, he swears by Noom. He used it. I mean, he's he's transformed his body, Reza. This guy's lost like 20. He went never like what I would call like overweight, but he has slimmed down tremendously. And he he swears by the way that it works because it just brings extra consciousness and information to your choices around food. It's not a diet plan. It is uh, a, a, a new way of interacting with food. The idea that I don't need rules in order to lose weight, but instead, you know, knowledge, wisdom, uh, the ability to just kind of build smarter, more sustainable eating habits. So start building better habits for healthier long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com slash milkshake. N-O-O-M.com slash milkshake. Noom.com. You know, we've mentioned this a few times on the podcast. Part of the reason why we even do this is because Rain and I love learning all the time. Like we just, I mean, we're just, you know, we're sponges. We just want to learn constantly with, albeit, as little effort as possible. (laughs) True. That's why we love Wandrium. I mean, it is the streaming service that our brains can't get enough of. There's so much to explore. We absolutely love, love it. If you're unfamiliar with Wandrium, it offers endless opportunities to learn something new with thousands of hours of video and audio content, which include fascinating documentaries, uh, helpful how-tos. Wondrium, let me spell it for you, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, Wondrium. I love watching it. It makes me feel good. It makes my mind buzz and click and flip out. And uh, I've been having so much fun watching Crimes of the Century, A Selective History of mm. Infamy. The plot to assassinate the Russian Romanov family is fascinating. I'm telling you, it is so addictive. We know you'll love Wondrium, so we put together a special offer for our listeners, a free month trial of unlimited access. Just go to our special URL. That's wondrium.com slash milkshake. That's wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash milkshake. Think of how much you'll learn in a month. Go to wondrium.com slash milkshake. Combined with metaphysical milkshake, and your mind will blossom like a rose. Well, you quoted uh, Carl Sagan earlier, and we have a lot of handy dandy Carl Sagan quotes because he apparently, yeah, he had a lot to say about he had a lot to say about everything, but especially Mars. And we're talking about Mars living so large in the cultural imagination. He said, maybe we're on Mars because we have to be because there's a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process we all come from, from hunter-gatherers, I'm transforming into Sagan, and for 99.9% of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers, and the next place to wander to is Mars. Spot on. <laughs> it's pretty good, Sounds actually. Sounds just That's, like it. Yeah. I, I love it, but then it kind of sparks the whole ethical side about uh, how to responsibly wander to other places. Well, so there you go. Let's right. go there. You know, obviously, this is the new obsession now. We're talking about not just exploring Mars. Colonizing? We're talking about colonizing Mars. Exactly. Like, let's let's go there and let's live there. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we would or we wouldn't and all that. But, I mean, I do... What, what Carl Sagan says sort of makes sense to me, like, at a, at a deep, um, you know, psychological level. Like, he's right. I mean, 99.9% of our existence as a species has been about 
wandering and and um and sort of exploring new worlds and so you know it kind of makes sense to think that well now that we've basically used up you know our planet that the next place to go is into space into to other worlds so there's all this excitement now and everyone's talking about what do we do are we going to colonize mars what's 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 going to happen when we get there and we can talk about you know the the feasibility of it. In fact, let's start there. That's a, yeah. before we get to the moral question. Okay, uh, I think that there is a sense among some you know a- amateur enthusiasts, uh, space enthusiasts, that like th- this shit is happening. Like we're all gonna be moving to Mars uh, any day now. First, first Elon, and then the rest of us. Prove us wrong. Prove that wrong. Okay. Apparently, it's slightly more complicated. That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get my blanket and get it, uh, douse some water on it because I'm going to throw a wet blanket on this uh, uh, whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, thought, I thought you meant like a, a blanket for the trip. Yeah, like a space blanket. First of all, I love, I, I would never want to truly be a wet blanket to those who are having these conversations because I think it could stem a lot of innovative thought because you, you have to bridge the gap between how where we are right now and how to get to that final point. And there are many, many steps to get there. So I think it's great that we're talking about it. The feasibility of doing that, if, if you could say, are we going to do it in the next 10, 20, 30 years? I would say probably not. Oh, what a bummer. So, and why do you say no? Yeah, the reason why, so our our bodies, we're very sensitive organisms. Uh, just going into space changes our body. There was that, you know, the twin experiment, right? Where mm-hmm. they, we had twin astronauts, one, stay, one went up to the IS, International Space Station, one mm-hmm. stayed on the ground. And just testing the, down to the genetic material, you can see changes that were already starting to happen. And those changes weren't necessarily all for the best. Uh, and as you float in, in the environment of space, your muscles atrophy, you have to find ways to solve that. Your heart is one of your biggest, or I wouldn't say most important muscles, but it's a very important muscle. Um, and you got to keep working those things out. And right now there aren't, I, I would say you could survive on Mars for a bit, but you won't be thriving hmm. <laughs> if, you, if we were to send someone to Mars. There's just so many things to understand. And that's why the Artemis program, uh, which is the NASA's initiative to send astronauts to the moon first and have it... Uh, be a test bed first uh, is a really great idea because I think there are just so many dots to connect that we need to start cut a little bit more locally and really vet it while we're a little bit closer to home just in case something happens. Well, let, let me jump in here because this is my opinion about this whole settle, settling Mars and why I think the movie, uh, the documentary, The Martian with Matt Damon is so preposterous. Like, oh, we just need a nice tent with some ferns and some carrots and potatoes and a nice space suit and we'll all be fine. It's like- And astronaut poop. And yeah. poop. Poop, yeah, potatoes. poop. Poop potatoes. Listen, it's easy. It's surface temperatures of 80 below zero, no breathable air, no protection from radiation from the sun. People would have to live underground, no magnetic field, which we talked about. Um, it can get down to 200 below zero and- the atmospheric pressure, forget the air is thinner. It's mostly carbon monoxide, uh, dioxide. And uh, it goes on, uh, gravity is only 40% of that on Earth. So the, it's, it's, it mm-hmm. is a nightmare. This kind of like utopian vision of like these little space pods and, and hydroponic gardens is, is preposterous. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I've had worse vacations. That that no. is not. <laughs> so tell us, Dr. Mu, why? You say exactly. Tell us why from your experience. No, I, I mean, I completely agree. And and there are people looking at creative ways to solve these issues. But yeah, you're right. There are not only the human factors that I pointed out, but like you were saying, the environmental constraints. Do you really want to? It, it's not easy to build a habitat to survive those high radiation uh, low temperature environments. I mean, you're being constantly bombarded by all of this UV. It's it's not pleasant. So yeah, it's not, it, it, there's a lot of instant gratification maybe that you see from TV shows and from movies, but that's not how it works in real life. We have a long way to go. How many years till we send a human being to Mars? What do you think? Again, do you want this person to survive or to thrive? It depends on who the person is. I mean, yeah. I think honestly, <laughs> like if, you know. 
What about all these astronauts that are um, talking about going and just dying on Mars and being buried on Mars? That just seems kind of macabre and weird, doesn't it? You could see Earth as a little blip out in the, in the horizon and you're like, I'm dying on another planet. Is that cool or is that kind of fucked up? Yeah, I mean, I could see that there are a group of people who just, the, the, the notoriety maybe, the, the fact that they're going to be written in the history books forever um, might be enough of a motivation for them to go there and just die. And, and that would kind of, with the state of technology, be the extent of what they can do <laughs> is, is go and, and die. Um, but yeah, the goal and, and with each step, for example, with this, this Mars 2020 rover, one of the instruments that it has is a MOXIE instrument. It converts the CO2 to oxygen and because right now there's no sustainable way of even having breathable air. Let, let's start with air. <laughs> kind of important. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need ways to have a sustainable infrastructure and right now. We, we just don't have it. So sending a person there is going to be tough. And once they get there, there's not a lot for them to uh, to stay protected unless they land in an area where there are lava tubes. So that's one of the places they're creatively looking at. Again, rain, as you said, it's ridiculously cold, you know, 80 sure. below. And that's at the highest temperature. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's that's on a warm day. That's a good day. Um it, it's just, we can't look at that as the, the silver bullet and say, yeah, forget about our planet. Let's, let's move on to another body. We really need to take care of our own blue marble because there's just way too many steps between now and sending humans to Mars, living there, thriving, surviving, enjoying. Well, all right. So now, now we're getting to the heart of this, right? Which is the less the, the technological and pragmatic issues involved in, in, uh, in colonizing Mars and more sort of the moral and ethical issues involved. And you brought up one of the main things that people always talk about, which is um, usually conversations about, you know, colonizing or settling on Mars have something to do with the fact that, well, th we fucked up this planet and uh, and we should probably figure out, you know, another planet, like someplace else to 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 start again, which even even as I say that out loud, I mean, you could obviously tell like the moral implications of that statement. And yet it is something that you hear a lot, right? I mean, this is the, what, you know, Elon Musk, who, by the way, has said that he does want to die on Mars. And I'm like, cool, that's I think we're all totally cool with you dying on Mars, Elon. Um, so he's this is his whole thing, right? That it's like, look, you know, we are facing the, these kind of existential problems here uh, on, on this planet. And if we want our species to survive, it's time to look to the stars. And over and beyond what you said about like, you know, the, the actual pragmatic, you know, possibilities of that, uh, there's something really fucked up about that that mindset, isn't there? I mean, like yeah. theoretically, it sounds nice, but no, we we no. really need to take care of our own planet. And and it's interesting because as I talk to to folks about space and and space exploration, I get a lot of well, why are you spending money on space? And are you just shooting money into uh, throwing loading rockets with money and throwing it in into out outer space? It's like, no, that's not what we do. And many of the missions actually that explore uh, our, our space environment are turned toward the Earth and learning more about our carbon footprint, about uh, fires and how they spread, um, about you know, urban population growth. I mean, this is all NASA data, right? It, it's mm. telling us about our own planet and how we can do a better job at, at protecting it. And I'm, I'm so glad. I mean, that that's... That's, I think, the reason for the season. We need a planet to live on. Really what you're saying is there's a difference between science and kind of space colonization slash imperialism. You know, it it reminds me of that. What's that? What did we learn in American history? That divine imperative to like colonize the West? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 for manifest destiny. Manifest yeah, destiny. Manifest like we have a manifest yeah. destiny to conquer these planets. Now, if there's not a shred of life on Mars, and I mean like not a bacterium or a germ, that's one thing we could have that discussion. There's still plenty of discussion to have. But, you know, Carl Sagan, again, said, if there is life on Mars, I believe we should do nothing with Mars. Mars then belongs to the Martians, even if the Martians 
are only microbes. And there has been a, a movement uh, uh, among people to say, hey, if there's any kind of life on this planet, which is kind of your job, by the way, um, kind of your job, related to your job, um, then we shouldn't we shouldn't go there. And, you know, interestingly enough, the, the political right, the National Review wrote an article about how uh, entitled wokists assault space yes. exploration. Like, oh, how dare we go, you know, we might step on yes. a germ on Mars. But what's your, what's your take on this? Yeah, it, it was because of Carl Sagan that we actually have a lot of our planetary protection rules and policies. And one of his big contributions is a probability of 10 to the minus four. So one in 10,000 of contaminating Mars. And that was mm. the upper limit. That's the probability when, as we're sending all these spacecraft to Mars, that was the maximum limit when we'd calculate how likely is it that this cesspool would contaminate Mars, it had to be at or below one in 10,000. And so he really helped shape the, the, the rules and the policies that we abide by today uh, in order to protect even the microorganisms so that we can do this, again, responsibly, ethically, um, and to be cognizant and fair uh, to possible life on different planets. It, it's the right thing to do. Folks, listen, times are tough out there. And if you're carrying a credit balance month after month, it can feel like you're in a never ending cycle of debt. So Upstart can help you make that final payment so you can get ahead. If you dread looking at your credit card statements, you're not alone. Debt can feel crippling, but Upstart can help you on your path to financial freedom. Over a half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. How delicious is that? I remember so clearly the day when I like paid off my debts. It was the greatest feeling. It was like having this weight just removed from my chest. I cried when I paid off my student loans. I looked at the world in a different way. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash milkshake. That's upstart.com slash milkshake. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know that we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. But go to upstart.com slash milkshake. Give it a try. It reminds me of one of my favorite songs, Modest Mouse Lampshades on Fire. Where the lampshades on fire, when the lights go out and the room's lit up and we ran about. This is what I really call a party now. Packed up our cars, moved to the next town. This song is actually, it sounds like a party song. You've probably heard it on the radio a thousand times. You know, know what my terrible rendition really means. But I will say the lyrics go, pack up again, head to the next place where we'll make the same mistakes. And um, uh, Isaac Brock, one of my favorite human beings on the planet, is uh, was talking about this song is actually about climate change and about um, how, you know, we'll destroy life on Earth and then we'll go to Mars. But But this leads me to another great song, which is David Bowie, Tell me, is there life on Mars? Um, and if there is, Dr. Moo, one germ, one bacterium on Mars, then there is life on other planets. This is not just like Reza said, well, so what do we step on some bacteria? Who cares? And I know you were saying that as a devil's advocate, but if there is something on another planet, that is proof that life exists on other planets. I mean, we kind of already know there's got to be life on other planets. I mean, come on, be reasonable. But that would be the biggest discovery of the eon to find a simple single cell bacteria on Mars, would it not? It would, and it would jeopardize our ability to do that as soon as we send humans there. Mm. And that's why it's so important to really understand the astrobiological landscape of Mars before we start you know, contaminating it with, with people. What about a TV show about a lonely android who's sent to the surface of Mars and he walks around all by himself? Then he gets sad. It's very sad, like, circuits too cold, powering down. Mm. Soaring music, pan back, reveal him all alone, frozen on the Martian landscape, tear. Pan back even further, there's the Statue of Liberty. It was Earth the whole time. The Boom. whole time it was Earth. <laughs> Oh my God, Reza, that's good. <laughs> Shit, write this down. Somebody write this down. Okay, what you just said is is super important because it's an amazing response to the devil's argument that I was making, which is, you know, 
microbe versus, you know, uh, unimaginable uh, uh, advantages uh, for humans. But it's not just a microbe. It is the overturning of every human philosophy of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, how we understand uh, the universe and God and the relationship between God and I mean, like the the first piece of bacteria we find on Mars changes everything. Like everything has to be rewritten. And so the the concept of doing whatever it takes to preserve that microbial life isn't a utilitarian argument any longer. It's a theological and philosophical argument. I mean, it's it's basically, you know, the 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 value of what it means to be human is what's at stake in how we deal with the thing that we find, regardless of how undeveloped that life is. Exactly. Wow, you took it there. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> so deep. I, I I never even thought about the theological side implications of finding life elsewhere. Yeah. That that's a fantastic point. But let's get let's get down to it. Isn't ultimately the reason that people want to explore Mars? I mean, NASA aside, gathering science, learning, okay, fine. But as soon as you get into colonization, I mean, let's just get down to brass tacks. We're human beings. We're we would be going to Mars because we want to exploit it. Mm -hmm. Isn't this what you know, whether it's NASA now, but private companies in the future or governments or, you know, North Korea sends a, a, a fleet of spaceships there in the year 2300 or something like that. Like, um, what is lost ethically when space exploration gets commercialized? And it's going to be commercial. Let's just be clear about this. NASA can't afford to send people to Mars. Only Bezos can afford something like that. So it's going to be commercialized anyway. Yeah, well, and that's the beauty of having the commercial entity versus the government sector, right? That the I've been asked in the past, right? Uh, well, are you competitors? Uh, what is the need? What what is the niche for each part? And the government, you know, the NASA side, NASA will still continue to send, for example, humans to the beyond to the next frontier because NASA focuses on what do we do to push our limits of understanding. It may not result in something that is profitable or maybe even applicable to anyone on Earth. But many of the technologies do eventually have an application that really does help the people of Earth out significantly. But NASA's goal is really to do the things that other people can't do. And then once the technology is developed, then you can give it to commercial entities to make it faster, better, cheaper, you know, affordable for others to exploit. <laughs> I'm just saying like, you know, once once Zuckerberg lands on Mars and dubs it Planet Facebook, like he's bigger than any government agency. He's bigger than any government. Uh, you know, he's richer than any government. And so, I just feel like how what what can little NASA do to control and create the the responsibility that we all know is going to be secondary to these, you know, commercial enterprises um, to make sure that we don't, you know, uh, do what like the, the European colonialists did when they encountered native populations, which is just accidentally kill everyone. Yeah. And this is where I look toward the next generation, because I just based on what I've seen these days, you know, recently politically, I'm just like, well, I, I lost hope in, the, in this group of people. <laughs> yeah, this one's so, done. So... I, I just hope that with all of the, the things that we're learning as we explore space, that it just grows the heart and the minds of the next generation so that they can fix uh, all of these gaps that exist right now that will unfortunately allow uh, commercial entities to kind of run away with it um, and and maybe even, you know, not not necessarily have planetary protection in mind, for example, as they explore. That needs to be changed Policy takes a long time to change, and I, I'm just hoping that the next generation will help keep the last generation kind of in check and say, "No, we gotta, we gotta do better." If you were a half mile under the surface of Mars, would you be warmed by the core of Mars? It wouldn't be balmy, but that doesn't matter for other forms of life 
here on Earth, for example, we there are these things called extremophiles that I, I love to study and my colleagues love to study. These are microbes that can survive in very extreme environments. And we learn, the more that we learn about those microbes, the more it expands our understanding of where life could persist and exist. And so there are environments that we've simulated, Martian environments on the Earth, where there are some microbes that are not happy. Again, not thriving, but surviving. Can I give you a fun fact about uh, another place that we should look at? Are you going to talk about Europa? Because Europa... Are yes. you say Europa? Oh my God. You don't even Just... know how obsessed I am with Europa. I think about it like all the time, which is a weird thing to say. Well, it's covered in water, right? It's covered in ice. Ice and then uh, water underneath. And then there's the water underneath. And I'm telling you, there's like, th- there's, of course, there's like, where there's water, there's life, right? Dr. Moo? Water yes. equals life. Yeah. I mean, the chance is very high. What are we doing? Let Tell us about, okay. Mars, yeah, fuck great, Mars. Great. Let's go yeah. to Europa. <laughs> Come on. Let's go to Europa. Europa, as you all know, moon of Jupiter, one of the many, many moons. It's like it has many children, um, but it's, you know, it's a little bit closer in, in the inner circle there. Europa has this, due to, because it's kind of, it's much closer to Jupiter itself. As you can imagine, as you orbit a planet, there are these things that these tidal fluxes. You're, if you are a planet with the force of gravity as you go around a, a body will make you flex and expand and that generates heat. And so there are these warm um, features underneath that thick layer of ice that allows it to keep a nice liquid water environment that is warmed up by those, those tidal forces, those geologic forces. Uh, and we have actually similar environments here on Earth. We have, if you go into the oceans and go deep down into certain regions, you can find these smokestacks where it's otherwise extremely cold, but you have these hot smokestacks. And if you take a sample there, you can find microbial life surviving, thriving, living it up. Okay, so when are we going to break the ice? When are we? When are we going to let's let's just take a, a giant bowling ball with a camera? See, I'm a scientist. We take a giant bowling ball with a camera. We drop it. And then that's it. We're done. We're, we've explored Europa. Even better, following the uh, bowling ball with the camera, then we take a big, uh, like one of those cargo containers filled with dolphins, and we drop those in, and then come back in a thousand years, and those dolphins will have evolved and have a whole, like... They'll be dolphin people. They will be worshiping the bowling ball. <gasps> that Ooh. Of course. That of will course. be in their temple, because they're like, where did this bowling ball come from? So uh, basically, we're at this point now where obviously we recognize the technological uh, challenges. We understand and are at least somewhat committed to the moral obligations that we have. But as a scientist, as an ethicist, as you're kind of looking at the very near future, do you see the human species as a multiplanetary species? Is that the inevitable future that we are that we are facing as a species? I think that that is definitely possible. And, and are we heading toward that direction? Yes, especially as propulsion systems catch up, right, to enable that. It's going to be difficult, for example, to, to send something to Mars. It was about a, a six-month cruise. Uh, it could be somewhere between six to nine months just to get to our closest neighbor, um, so there are advances in propulsion systems happening that will help make our ability to be multiplanetary um, a, a possibility. But again, it goes back to that, you know, that whole question of we are we going to survive? We can survive but not thrive. I mean, we could go there for exploration. I don't think that we would go there to call or other to other planets to colonize. I don't think we should <laughs> um, for for any long term plan, right? To to survive. Um, versus having our own beautiful uh, blue marble here. Uh, So yeah, yes, I could see that as an inevitable future, but again, just for for exploring and and seeing, just just understanding more about our solar system, but not necessarily to colonize and thrive. And as our hero Carl Sagan would say, there is nowhere else, at least not in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand.
Well, Dr. Moo, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating, but it is now time for the lightning round. Lightning right. round. Here we go. If you could have lunch with any scientist, fiction or nonfiction, and you can't say Carl Sagan because then we can't have four Carl Sagan references, uh, what, who would that be? Oh, Neil no. deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know. Uh, yeah, you know, that's fine. Just make sure you have a, a, a chaperone with you. That's all. Dr. Moo, what was the happiest day of your life? Ooh, the happiest day of my life uh, when I gained independence of my own person. <laughs> that's such a loaded... Uh... <laughs> uh, knowing you, when was that? Like 14? <laughs> yeah, you were, no, you were seven. 12? Shoot, how old was I? Uh, 20? <laughs> nine, no, 18. What is one eye-opening experience every person should have? I kind of referred to this a little bit earlier in our um, conversation, but just experience a different religion than your own mm. because it opens your mind up to just a, a different approach to kind of this, the same question. What's uh, one thing that a lot most people like but that you can't stand? Oh, man, so many things. I was going to say Neil deGrasse Tyson, but go ahead. You... <laughs> <laughs> uh, bad puns. Describe your soul in 10 words or less. Open to receiving and finding joy in life. Let's go. Okay, uh, this is a serious question. Who would make a better astronaut, uh, me or Rain? Oh, I, can I say the both of you? Because, you know, human factors, uh, to be an astronaut, you can't, it's, it's better to go with a partner, to have someone to balance you, because it's a Aww. long journey. We could podcast all the way to Mars. There you go. Rain, you know what, Rain? You balance me. Oh. Yeah, see? It's the yin and the yang. It's like, yeah. you, you can't you can't pick one. Dr. Moo, when do you feel most connected with the universe? I, I try to be at all times, but for sure in the morning when I wake up and I'm just happy that I'm not dead. <laughs> that sounds really morbid. It's a great thing. Wake but... up and be like, ah, oh, not dead. Great day. There is something in incredibly miraculous about uh, the miracle of consciousness and your eyes open up and you're like, wow, I'm online. I have thoughts and feelings and perceptions. I can do things. I, have, I can take action. And uh, it, what an incredible miracle that I get to smell a flower or, or throw a ball or even have a conversation. Exactly. I agree. Yep. And on that note, finally, uh, what is your life's big question? Are we alone in this universe? Mm. I mean, it's kind of cheesy, brings it full circle, but that's that's what sparked my interest and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Moo. That was a, amazing. That was a deep dive into, yeah. into yeah. Mars. I don't know. I got to be honest with you. Like, I, I'm still... I feel a little bit more optimistic about humans going to Mars than I think uh, Dr. Moo uh, was. Of course, she's a scientist and I'm not, so what the hell do I know? But wouldn't you move to Mars if you could? I mean, if it was safe. I'm not saying like it's, you know, you go there and it's 880 eight degrees below. Or what is it? 800 degrees below zero? What is it? No, it's it, it lingers between 80 and 180 degrees below zero. Well, that ain't so bad. Yeah. You know, wear a, wear a scarf. Just layer. You have to layer. Layers. It's layers. And also those little things you crinkle up that make your gloves warm, the glove warmers. Okay, let's assume you can you can have like, you know, a biodome there and like breathable atmosphere yep. and uh and you know, you you got electric blankets. Is there Uber Eats? <laughs> there is a, there's no there's a Shake Shack, but that's it. Ooh. That's you have to have Shake Shack morning good, and night. Good choice, by the way. If there was gonna be one franchise on Mars, yeah. that might be the one. Reza, I'm I'm not the person for the job. I'm really not in any way, shape, or form. You seem adventurous. No, I'm like in um a, a, in a Ferris wheel, and I get claustrophobic being uh, a pie in a Ferris wheel. And you know, I, if I fly in like a small plane, like one of those commuter planes with like mm -hmm. twenty seats, I, I start to 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 quiver and shake and and sweat. And me sweating. It's not attractive. And it could, it could put the rest of the team in danger. It really could. I would move to projectile vomiting. If they could inject me with something and put me to sleep and I just, like a surgery, and then you wake up on Mars. Okay. I would consider that. I would consider that. Here's how I would consider it if I was in my 70s. And I would be like, I'm going to spend my waning years on another friggin' planet. That's going to be cool. 
That's pretty but, cool. But what good would I be to any mission at age 74? I'd- what I want to know is like, what exactly would be your role on that team? Like you're the, the, like the, the comic relief. Yeah. I would tell stories about <laughs> Steve Carell. I would just, it would only be like, what was your favorite uh, cold open prank with Jim on the office? And <laughs> that, I would just <laughs> listen, worth it. Here's what I would say. Here's, and, and I think this is, I love that we kind of ended on this point with Dr. Moo, which is that we study Mars. We explore Mars. We visit Mars, not so we could live on Mars but so that we could live on earth. And I think that that, that's a beautiful thought. And it's, and it, you know, I think it sort of reformulates the way that we even think about space or exploration, because, you know, you and I, we grew up on Star Trek and Star Wars and, you know, space exploration is all about, let's go there. And she's like, no, 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 let's go there so that we could come back and fix this. And I think that that in the end is kind of the, best way to think about it. That really, truly shifted my perspective on what NASA does and yeah. what JPL does and what, um, and the importance of stressing, you know, interplanetary, uh, missions just for, for the data, for the science. And, um, much of it will be imminently usable. So tell us, oh dear listeners, would you go to Mars? Would you colonize another planet, even if it was a one-way trip? Is that something that you would do like I would do in my 20s, but not in my, let's just say 40s, mid-late 40s? Let's go milkshakers. So we've mentioned this many times before. Uh, We said if you go and rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts, uh, say something nice about us, uh, take a screenshot, tag us on Instagram, and who knows, we might actually invite you to come on the show and discuss your life's big question. And many of you didn't believe us, and so now we have no choice but to actually prove it to you. Guess what? We have someone here with us, Mariah. Hey, Mariah. Hi, how are you? To uh, Metaphysical Milkshake. Uh, my life's big question. Oh, wow. Um, I've been pondering it for a while, and I started listening to your guys' podcast, and I was like, you two are the perfect two to answer my question. All right, hit us. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So my life's big question is, is it ethical to have a child or children in today's society? Um, I question this all the time because there's so many factors from uh, an individual perspective, uh, the political culture or the healthcare system where one lives, and then on a global perspective, overpopulation, food shortages, and of course, the big one, climate change, um, the impending end of the world as we know it. Yep. Um, is it an ethical decision? For a lot of millennials, this is uh, a lot of folks feeling like why, why are we going to have kids now? What, yeah. what hope is there for the future? You know, generation after generation, there was always hope of like, oh, next generation, it's going to get better. You know, the economy is going to get better. Racism is going to get better. Social ills are going to get better. Medical science will improve. Suffering will reduce, et cetera. And this is kind of the first generation in a long time that is kind of like, well, wait a second, things are actually getting worse. Yeah. So is it ethical to have to bring a child into a world that is getting worse. It's a fantastic question. And you know, you know, you know what the answer is? I have no idea, but I bet Reza does. <laughs> well, let me ask you, this is a, a thing that I, I thought about a lot. I think when I was younger, and even when I met my wife, uh, I was definitely in the the fewer kids, the better camp uh, for all the reasons that you were saying, but also some like, you know, life reasons, like wanting to have one, for instance. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, this whole notion of we're leaving the world a worse place for our children. Uh, the future is bleak. Um, you know, the cost to the planet, um, you know, overpopulation, all of those things were, were stuff that I really, really thought about. And then uh, since that time, I've had four children. <laughs> and and my my thinking on this has evolved and i by the i completely respect you know the people on the other end of the of the aisle you know people like rain with their one child so easy so easy it's not even parenting <laughs> i mean i bet you take naps don't you rain hey reza every day 
things called naps. I remember them. Refreshing naps. And I'm being 100% honest here. I'm not being facetious at all, Mariah. I've come to kind of the opposite viewpoint, which is that the world is shit and it's getting shittier. The planet is on fire. And so in a weird sense, it's like all I can really rely on is my family unit. So I think of my family, which is now with my wife, six people. I think of us as kind of like this clan, you know, like sometimes I have these post-apocalyptic fantasies, you know, where we're like living on a burned out uh, planet uh, on a, on a like hill. Like a quiet place. Yeah, exactly. Like a, a quiet place. And we have to be really, really silent, which is impossible for my twins to do. Um, so we'd probably be fucked very early on in that movie. But nevertheless, and it's like, here we are. It's like the olden days. It's like we're colonials, like, you know, living off the land, uh, you know, except trying to shoot zombies that are trying to get into our our property line. Uh, but but I'm not joking. I mean, I really do think of it as like the 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 last bastion of salvation in this planet is me and my four kids and my wife. And it's like I've gone from thinking of it as a family and and instead now thinking of it as like a clan, a unit in preparation for the end times. I sound a little bit crazy. I mean, we don't have, it's now, not like we're is, end timers. Now, hold on a second here. Hold on a second. I thought when you were going to be, when you were beginning, Reza, I thought you were like, going to be like, you know, but, but I made the choice along with my wife to have these children because we were going to instill in them a love of humanity. <laughs> they were going to save the world. the world a better place. And that together we were going to work to improve <laughs> conditions for the poor. And the, instead you're like, no, we're a clan. Yeah. We're a clan. We're in our cave <laughs> and we've got our deer jerky and we've got our thigh bone clubs and Sorry. we're just our clan yeah. and we're just going to watch Netflix and protect our cave. God damn it. Like, well, uh, the worst human impulse. I know. The I know, worst, right? most ancient human impulse, clannishness. I know. I know. A kind of, a, kind so of a clannishness that you deride on your Twitter feed constantly. <laughs> we're um, we're de-evolving. We're de-evolving. We're going back into our cave. Going. I like how you brought that up because one thing I think about is, you know, apocalypse. Like, but do you want to have to take care of a child through that? or And how many? Very good you point. You know, like. It's a very, very good point. But look, I'll be honest. First of all. I think Jessica would definitely be in that in that category. My wife is is like, well, but our children are going to save the world, and so that's that's her philosophy, and she's not wrong. Um, but I will say, like this COVID pandemic was a little taste, you know, just a teeny little taste of that, and it was like it was hard for everyone. I know it was very very difficult, but for us, it was like the six of us with the doors locked. Inside the house, 18 months. It was like a little bit of a, a prep session for the coming zombie apocalypse. And I got to be honest with you, it was pretty fucking fantastic. Just the six of us. <laughs> now, Mariah, what about you? What are you? What are your <laughs> thoughts here? This is a question that's been eating away at you. Do you have any? Have you? Do you have a, a strategy for this one, or is it, is it something that keeps you up at night? Um, it, it still keeps me up at night. I'm constantly um, trying to figure it out. Honestly, I used to be on the side of, no, I don't think it's ethical um, because of overpopulation, climate change. Why bring more people to the earth to take up more resources to an possible eventual end anyway? Um, but honestly, I listened to like your podcast with Dr. Alfie mm. and that gave me hope, you know, that children growing up now are equipped with different tools to make it through their life and to make that change. So uh, that gave me hope. And then your podcast with Elizabeth Colbert, when um, she talked about manipulating the environment to our advantage. I mean, if that's possible and people can have children to raise them and do these great things, then absolutely, you know, so I can see both sides of it. And that's why I thought, you know, you guys would like it because, there's, it can go either way, really. To reference uh, Naomi Klein, who was our guest, talking about creating the next generation of change agents in the world. So 
that's got to be a, a factor to add to the uh, education of a child, which is, um, hey, the world is going to pot in a lot of ways. It's also getting better in a lot of ways as well. We can look at both of those things. Um, they're kind of happening simultaneously. There's a disillusion and a unification happening at the same time, but we have to equip our children to be ready for that and and to fight for justice and to fight to make the world a better place. Yeah, and in all earnestness is that a kid, you know, it's a cliche. It changes everything. It does change everything. But one of the things that it most definitely changes is your perspective on the world. You know, like when it's you, it's hard to think past your own life, right? Um, and it changes your values. It changes your point of view. It changes how you respond to people in the world around you. And then once you have children, you're like, oh, my life now has been extended, you know, by with their lives. And so the things that I do now, I need to do in order to preserve their place in the world and the world itself. And it it does, so many of my actions are motivated by the fact that I do want my children to be you know, the, the people who solve the problems. And I do want um, the world to be in a place that gives them the opportunity to do so. Um, so maybe that's a little bit selfish, you know, and in some in some ways, but it does allow me, I think, to be much more strident in the, the way that I approach uh, the care of the planet, the care of other people. Um, it's almost like, you know, one of the things that all parents have is this kind of nesting impulse that suddenly happens. Like you bring the baby home and like all you want to do is like nest. Well, it's almost like that the world becomes the nest. And so I, I'm out there trying to build the kind of world that I want them to live in. It's, you know, not everybody needs that kind of motivation. Some people just do it for, for the other people's sake, I suppose. But uh, knowing that it's for my children, the people that I love more than anything else in this world is certainly an extra motivation. I just want to highlight your work, Reza, on this show, My Name is Al, which is about an Afghan translator. And it's a, it's a multi-camera kind of sitcom for a large audience. And man, oh man, has that show become like the most relevant show <laughs> on all of television right now. Um, well, it's, an, um, it's an Afghani translator who served in the war you know, at home in the Midwest. And uh, now this is a very, very real, it was always an issue, but now it's especially real. And that's part of your work, I think, of making the world a giant nest. I love that metaphor, by the way, is to make, you know, entertainment that also opens people's minds to other realities and ultimately creates a greater sense of community and unity. I oh, appreciate that. Just, I mean, no big deal, but it's called the United States of Al, but you know, it's fine. All it, <laughs> my name is Al. Like my name is Earl, which I loved, by the way. That was a great movie. Mariah, does any of this help at all? Is this any of this clarifying? <laughs> no, no, it helps. It helps. I like seeing all angles of it. So thank you so much for that wonderful question and for calling in. It's a pleasure talking to you and best of luck with everything out there in Maine and in marriage. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you guys so much. It was great to meet you. You can find us on our socials at Reza Aslan, at Rain Wilson, and of course, at Metaphysical Milkshake. And remember to follow, rate, and review Metaphysical Milkshake on Apple Podcasts and wherever else you listen to your podcasts. And of course, you can also subscribe to Metaphysical Milkshake on our YouTube channel so that you can watch us having these incredible debates. You want to know what Rain looks like when he embodies Marvin the Martian, then you're going to have to subscribe to our YouTube channel because that's the We will way. see you next week with the Intergalactic Space Modulator. <laughs> see you next week. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, and Colin Thompson. It's produced by Safa Samizadeh Yaz, Harris Lane, Mick DeMaria, Hashem Self, and DJ Lubel. Cast Media is the production and distribution partner. It is edited by Tyler Newbold and audio mixed by Justin Kyle. Original music is composed by Jeff Tang. Let's send Ben Affleck to Venus. That's what I was going to say. If you were going to send one of them, send Ben Affleck. 
Hey, thanks for watching, you guys. For more fantastic videos just like the one that you watch, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.